Simple rules for life. Now, into the story here. When, when asked what they needed to do in order to be faithful to God, um, some of his friends were asking him, John Wesley's friends were saying, John, what do we, if we want to be more faithful to God, what do we need to do? Because he was this really spiritual man. And, and the people around him saw that and they looked up to it and said, we kind of want to be more like John, okay? And, and so they said, John, what do we have to do in order to be more faithful to God? Well, rather than give them some complex system, John Wesley gave his friends three very simple rules. They weren't long and complex, just simple rules that would be easy for people to remember and to follow. His three rules were these. We talked about two weeks ago, do no harm. This week, we're going to talk about do good. Okay, I can remember those so far. And number three, stay in love with God, right? Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. Pretty simple. Now, Wesley, of course, didn't really make up these rules himself. These rules are, are based on guiding principles we find all over throughout Scripture. Um, we find them in the various commandments that God has given us. And as I said, two weeks ago, we learned about this first principle about doing no harm and how God guides his people um, to love with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? We, we, we know that. That's called the Shema, if you come from a, a Jewish background. It's a, the Shema is this thing that you're taught as a young Jew. You're supposed to say this each and every day, that you're supposed to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Uh, that's a valuable thing. That's a good thing. We should probably repeat to ourselves every morning. When I wake up, I should say, God... Let me love you with all that I have, with every fiber of my being, my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength, right? Uh, a great command that was given to Israel, but a command that still applies to us. Now, this command to love God was this guiding overall principle for all of God's people. Now, in an effort to be faithful, as we read the Old Testament, as it translates into the New Testament times, we see they took the laws that God gave them, the, the Israelites did. God give, gives them these rules. We can find them in Exodus. We can find them in Leviticus. He gives them these rules and says, here's how you should live. Well, part of that process, as they were living that out, uh, the Israelites found that if they made a few more extra rules, it sometimes would help them keep from breaking some of the other rules, right? And so... Through a period of centuries, in fact, the rules start to add layers upon layers of rules. Rules for rules about rules. To the point at which, eventually, there comes to be 613 different laws that you had to follow to be a good, observant, practicing Jew. Now, when Jesus is, is walking the earth and in his time of ministry... Some, some people come up to him and they say, say Jesus, we've got all these laws. We've, we've got all these rules that we have to follow. There, there's 613 of them. Jesus, what, what of all of these is the most important for us to do? You know what Jesus' answer was, of course, right? Love God. Not only love God, though, but love God. And then Jesus added this, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. What Jesus did was to say that, that loving God couldn't be expressed just in our words towards God, but that it had to move from just thinking and words and had to move into our attitudes and into our feelings and the living it out, the, the living of our heart towards God has to go into loving others as well. It has to be lived out in our relationships in very real, intangible ways. It's, it's not enough, Jesus is saying, just to say, yes, I love you, God. Jesus is saying, you have to take it to the next step. You have to get out there. You have to take a little bit of a chance and love others. Love for God has to be turned into loving action towards others. That's one of the biggest messages Jesus had for us. Now, as we read the scriptures, um, the apostle John seemed to really have a good understanding of this. Years later, as John was, was writing to the church, he, he writes this in 1 John 4, 20 through 21. You see it on the screen here. 
John writes these words. And, and, and if you remember, John was the one who was called Jesus' favorite, right? John was, was tight with Jesus. John loved Jesus and Jesus loved John. And so John, in remembering the teachings of Jesus, writes this to the church. He says, if anyone says that I love God and yet hates his brother, he is a liar. Ooh, wow. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So, to love God means that we love our brothers and sisters, but then John makes it clear that by loving our brothers and sisters, it means that we have to reach out to them, that we have to help them. Again, it's not just enough to say, I love you, God, and I love you, brother. It's more. While the distance between head and heart isn't very far, the distance in knowing that I love God and knowing others and actually living it out, somehow as humans we can make those miles apart, can't we? So, so John is saying, live it out. So John says in 1 John three sixteen and 17, many of you know this, but he says this. John writes, by this we know love that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love then abide in him? So to, to love God means that we love others, and loving others means that we reach out to them and we help them in real and tangible ways and this forms the foundation for John Wesley's second rule. Do good, right? Do no harm, number one. But it's not enough just to do no harm. Do no harm can be passive, right? I can sit at home doing no harm. I don't have to get involved. I don't have to get my hands dirty if all I have to do is do no harm, right? So John Wesley, he was a smart guy. He says, do no harm. That's important. But do good. Get in the game. Do good. Get out there. So doing good is putting God's love into action. Doing good is loving our neighbors as ourselves. And the Bible is full of passages that affirm this teaching. If you're following along, you can look in your Bibles, uh, you can see on the screen, if you've got your, your iPhones or whatever, feel free to open up version on your Bibles. Uh, look at Luke 6, Luke 6, 27 through 36. I'll read that to you here, it's a little bit lengthy, but Luke 6, 27 through 36. An important passage. Luke writes this, Luke 6, 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek. Right? What do we do? We offer him the other. From the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Right? The golden rule. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the very same. If you lend to those whom you expect to receive, what credit then is that to you, Luke says? Even sinners lend to other sinners to get back the same amount. Here's one of the big buts in the Bible. But, but love your enemies. Wow. It's not what the world teaches. Love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. That's a promise in the Bible, folks. 
your reward will be great. And you will be the sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. That's not what I see on my TV. How about you? Not in the movies I've seen, TV shows I've watched. If you happen to mistakenly land on a news station, ooh, I don't see it there. Right? Particularly not in this political cycle that we're in. The world doesn't live this way. And again, we see here that Jesus links together loving God with loving our neighbor. Those were the words of Jesus we just heard. And even, even our enemy, loving them too. Sometimes I jokingly say, invite people to church. Your friends, your neighbors, your family. And even your enemies. But I'm kind of serious too. Because that's what Jesus would do. Loving others means actually doing something for them. Right? If you love your wife, if you love your husband, if you love your kids, you never did something for them. Do you think they're going to feel loved? I don't think so. If you never sacrifice of yourself for the people in your life that you love, are they really going to believe that you deeply love them? Probably not. How then is it different? in our relationship with the Almighty, with the Creator God, with the One who loved us long before we ever knew of Him, let alone knew to love Him. Loving others is not a, a feeling or an emotion. It is helping to meet their real needs and offering them grace and mercy. Two of the most powerful words in all of the English language are grace and mercy because so often they're not practiced. So rare is grace. So rare is mercy in our culture. Mercy is undeserved, right? Somebody has mercy on you. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it came nonetheless, right? That's what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus says this again in John 13, if you're following along, in John 13, 34. These are the words of Jesus, folks. A new commandment I give to you, that you, you, me, this new commandment I give to you, that you, Love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, by this us loving others, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have a love for one another. Wow. Wow. Love one another. We hear this affirmed by the Apostle Paul as well, right? Smart guy. Knew a lot. Wrote a bunch of the New Testament. Very influential guy. Paul writes this in Romans 12. Romans 12, 9 through 13. Paul says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another by showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Right? 
Paul is making it clear that our love needs to extend to others in very real ways. And so it's clear that the foundation of the Christian faith is to love others, which means that we have to seek ways to do good for them. And John Wesley made sure that his followers understood the depths of this call to do good by telling them not only should we do good, but these are the words of John Wesley. He says, do all the good that we can, right? By all the means that we can, in all the ways that we can, in all the places that we can, at all the times that we can, to all the people that we can, as long as we ever can. That statement begins to answer some of our questions about doing good. If I was to ask, who should we do good for? The answer is, to all the people that we can, right? If I was to say, where should we do good? Should we just do it in the church? Or maybe just in our neighborhood? Or maybe just in our town? The answer is, do good in all the places we can. Do we just do good by simply giving away our money, right? Or do we take it to that next step? Money is important. Giving money away to things that need money, important. Good stuff. But can we just get by by writing a check? Right? Or do we actually have to go to that next step? It's great to write a check, folks. It's great to give cash. And you know, we've got kids who are raising funds for a lift a coming up and all sorts of other things that are going on, all sorts of good causes. That's, that's a good thing. Give. But don't stop there. Don't think that when you rip that check out, that's the end of your involvement. Give of your time, your treasure, your talents. Give of your prayers. We believe in a God who hears our prayers. Maybe you don't have a whole lot of time to give this day. Maybe the checking account balance has more numbers after the period instead of in front of it. Ever been there? I've been there. But can you still give prayer? Can you still go physically and serve? Yes, you can. Give by all the means in which we can. We do whatever we can to do good. Are we ever going to stop doing good? No. The answer is no. We do good as long as we can. What Wesley was saying is that the call to love others is extensive and comprehensive. There is no limit to the love that we are to show God and others. And the reason for that is because there was no limit when Jesus went to the cross and he died for us and he gave his life for us. When he took his sins from us, he didn't go, but only to this point, right? I'll forgive you to there. I'll love you to there. And I'm done. That's it. That's all I'm willing to give. Because that's it. Right? Is that what Jesus did? No. Did Jesus say, I'll, I'll forgive you till you're 30, and then your sins after that are in your own? I hope not, because I'm past 30. And I keep sinning. Right? That was a blank check that Jesus wrote. It was an endless check. Mercy and grace. John 1, our first John 3.16. By this we know love, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we then ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. This makes it so abundantly clear that Jesus was willing to love us so completely that he gave his life for us, that he died for us on the cross. And if this is the example of love and of doing good that we are to follow, then there's simply no limit to the love that we are to show to others. 
We do all the good we can in all the times we can, in all the places we can, by all the means that we can for all of our lives, folks. Now, if you're like me, you start asking the question, so I hear you saying this, Pastor, but just really what does that mean? I mean, what specifically is the good that I'm supposed to do? You know, maybe you're one of those list-making kind of people, right? Well, I'm not going to give you a list of how to do good today. But there's lots of ways. We can feed the hungry. We can clothe the naked. We can visit those who are sick or in prison. But I don't think Jesus ever wanted us to simply make a list so we could check the stuff off. He wanted to take the command to love our neighbor and turn it into a comprehensive way of life, not just a simple checklist for us to follow. I believe fully that Jesus wanted us to make this the way in which we live. And I believe fully that if we make this the way in which we live, we will change the world. Because this isn't how the world lives. But this is what the world needs. I know that absolutely. Am I loving my neighbor? Am I loving my neighbor in the best way that I can? If this becomes our guide, if this guides our actions, then we will find ourselves doing more good without ever needing a checklist. More good than we could ever imagine. I'll tell you a story, break this up, and then we'll come to a conclusion. A few weeks ago, a month and a half ago, You might have received what seemed at the moment like a somewhat random email from my wife. Not everybody got it, but a few of you got it because she only had a few people's emails at the time. And she just asked for prayer for us, for me specifically, about a a situation that we were dealing with and she didn't really give any details to it. And it ties in actually pretty nicely with what I'm talking about today. So let me share a little bit about that. Not because of, I I don't want like, hey, pat on the back, pastor, that's not what it's about but just an example about how in our lives we can go about doing this. My wife is highly empathetic. I'm probably embarrassing her because she's in the room. But she's a highly empathetic person. If, if she was empathetic for pets, we would have like 50 of them. <laughs> Thankfully, she's not a cat lady. <laughs> Whew, I'm allergic. I'm allergic to cats, so. But, but she is just, I mean, in the spectrum of empathy, she is towards the high end of empathy, okay? And because of that, she's kind of a magnet for people who are in need. Like, I I can't even begin to tell you how people in need find my wife. It it just happens. So she was working on some grad school papers. Many of you know she's trying to finish up a master's, and she's working on these grad school papers at McDonald's because they have Wi-Fi there, and she could get out of the house, and I wouldn't be a distraction. And she was over at McDonald's studying one, one morning, and as she's studying, um, there's, there's a young lady sitting in a booth. And that might not be a, a big deal, but this young lady happens to be sitting in a booth with a couple of chainsaws and a bunch of bags, like a suitcase and chainsaws. Okay. Right? Uh, you, you can picture this. Our McDonald's, two chainsaws and a couple of bags and an iPad and a phone sitting there. So Kim studies and somehow, some way. A conversation is struck between the two of them because, as I said, she's this magnet. And this young lady, come to find out, is stranded in Aiken. She had spent the previous night in jail. And when they let her out of jail, they drove her to McDonald's and dropped her off. Why McDonald's? We don't know. But there she was. So she's sitting in McDonald's trying to get a ride home. She doesn't live here. She lives in Coon Rapids. She's trying to get a ride because her ride is still in jail. And he's not getting out probably for a while. So she is emailing, texting, calling till her phone is dead, anyone she can, saying, you come up to Aiken and get me. I need a ride. I need to get back home so I can get back to work, so I can get back to life. I got nowhere to sleep, I got nowhere to stay, and I got no money with me. Right? So here she sits, Kim has this conversation with her, goes back to studying, kind of 
puts it out of her mind, works on her papers. Eventually, after working at McDonald's for a number of hours, she comes home. We do some other stuff. We have dinner, whatever. Kim says, I'm going to go back to McDonald's. I'm, I'm going to study some more tonight. So she goes back to McDonald's. And this is getting late into the evening. And she's at McDonald's once again. And this young lady is still sitting in the same booth with the same chainsaws and the same suitcase. She's been there, folks, all day long now. Okay? Still sitting there. So, um, again, my wife engages her in conversation and then calls me. Right? And she doesn't really tell me much on the phone other than there's a lady here who needs a ride to Malacca. So like an hour's drive away, two-hour round trip. Can you come give this lady a ride? Oh, and by the way, she spent last night in jail. Click. <laughs> what? Huh? I guess. Uh, I'll be there in a few minutes. I mean, this is... If, if I could say this was odd, this isn't that odd. This is life with my wife. <laughs> That's a good thing, folks. That's not a bad thing. But it is a funny thing sometimes. And so I get to McDonald's. Um, and I get a little bit of the background and, and just my wife says she needs a ride to Malacca and yada yada. Okay, fine, I'll take her. But by the time I get there, it's like 9.30 at night, right? So, so we load, I drive a Honda Accord, which isn't a big car. We load the chainsaws and her suitcase in the back of the car. And I think, okay, we're going to take off. Oh, no. No, she goes, oh, we need to go back to the sheriff's office because the rest of my stuff is still there. Oh, okay. So we pull into the sheriff's office and literally sitting outside on the grass is another pile of bags. So we fill the entire back seat of my car with these other bags and we head on down the road, right? Now as I'm driving, you know, I, I, I ask some questions. I try to be a little pastoral. I try to engage her in conversation. We, we do have a little bit of a meaningful conversation about making good decisions in life and... Um, <laughs> You know, all that was good and great, but the truth of the matter was, by the time I got there and got to, you know, help her bring her stuff into the apartment building where she was going to spend the night, I didn't get to lead her to the Lord, I, you know? She knew I was a pastor, and she knew Kim was a pastor's wife, and she knew, you know, we lead a church, and, you know, I, I was clear about a number of things in that regard, but I didn't get to transform her eternity that I know. Um... I, I don't know what kind of impact that will have long term even. But we're called to do good. Even sometimes if that means even as a pastor I don't get to lead somebody to Jesus. I still got to go do good. Now thankfully I'm married to a woman who's more naturally inclined to doing good than I am. Which at times can of course be exasperating but it's a blessing to have that to have that extra empathy in my life. So we did good. Not again so I could, you know, it makes a good sermon story, but not, not so we could get any recognition for this because that's not what it's about. It's simply just to serve as an example of even at McDonald's you can go and do good in Aiken, Minnesota. You just never know who God's going to put in your path, when God's going to put them in their path, why God's going to put them in your path. Right? But you do know, as far as you are concerned, that you can do good. And then what God does with it from there, that's up to Him. I made a couple of suggestions to her, knowing that she lives in Coon Rapids. I said, hey, I've got a couple of buddies who have churches in that area. Here's a few of their names and here's a few of those churches if you're, you're looking to maybe make those sort of connections. Um, I, you know, one church I said, I, said I, ha I know this particular church has a, a, a recovery program called Celebrate Recovery. It's a very powerful program. Um, if you're looking for something like that, I said, I know this is here and this is there. And just kind of had to leave it at that. 
we as the body of Christ, we as Christians and Aikens, we, 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 in this area at least, we need to do more of this. We need to be the people who are going about doing good in this community, not because somebody's going to repay us, not because she'll ever probably show up at church. Even if she did, I don't even know that I'd remember what she looks like. That's not why we do it. We do good. We are graceful. We are merciful. We are generous because the great and glorious God that we serve has been more generous and more loving and more graceful and more merciful than we could ever, ever deserve or repay. That's why we do it. Not for pats on the back or recognition. None of that. We have a a youth pastor who reaches out into the community, brings kids here who don't go to church, who go to church at other churches, because we know if they're here, they're going to hear about Jesus. So we invest there. We invest in a VBS program so that kids from all over the region, in fact, some kids from all over the state, I mean, we've got kids coming from the Twin Cities to go to our VBS. We invest there so that we can do good so that we might make a difference. We go and serve, like on August 1st, like I was talking about earlier, at First Lutheran Church. We go and serve there. We go and provide food. We go set up tables. We go wipe off tables in a church that isn't even ours. Not for recognition for us, but because we can do good, folks. We can love others well. We know we can't fix everything. But we know we can do something, right? We can get in the game. Now this fall, we're going to try to roll out some small groups, Bible studies. One of the components of those small groups are going to be service projects. We're going to try to give you some opportunities collectively to do good. Another thing that I'd really like to do, uh, just earlier this spring, I had a conversation with Jesse Peterson. He's the principal at our elementary school in Aiken. And I planted a seed there with Jesse. I said, Jesse, start thinking about how our church could love you, your teachers, and your students. What can we do to love them and serve them? Again, not because we need anything from them, but just because. We want to do good. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks I'll get to sit down with Jesse and maybe he'll have a couple of ideas. I've got a few ideas, but if he's got something better, I think we're going to do that. Our hearts and lives must be shaped and guided by love, as we saw in the scriptures earlier. As we saw in Luke 6. We don't lend expecting to receive back. Because if we're doing so, it ceases to be good. If we're motivated by our pride, if we're motivated by our ego, if we're motivated by the desire to be recognized or noticed, then our actions stop being good. In fact, then they become sinful. So we need to make sure that the good we do is for the sake of others and for the sake of Christ alone. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 3 through 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. We don't give so the world will know. We give so the world will know Him. Not about us. May it never be about us. Because too many times in this world, the world lives by quid pro quo, right? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You do for me, I'll do for you. That's the way the world works. Folks, we live in the world, but we are aliens. We are not of this world. This is not our home. And we don't have to live by those rules. And if we want to make a difference in the world, we have to live differently. 
So my challenge to you this week, my challenge to you this week, my challenge to you every week, I've been preaching on this since I got here and I'll be preaching on this when I leave. I'll be preaching on this till the day I die. Maybe you'll get tired of it. Fire me. That's okay. I can live with that. But do good. Go into the world today. Do good. Love others. Serve others. To make much of Jesus and not much of you. And if you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and you keep on doing this, whenever you can, wherever you can, as often as you can, for as long as you can, God will use it however God sees fit. But at the end, at the very end, when they fill in that mark on your tombstone after the dash, if we have done this, you will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Love God, love others, repeat. Amen? Let's pray.